Some of the scriptures that I'm going to go over, uh, Neil Neil went over as well. And uh, but hey, it's it's uh, we're coming upon the season of uh, Passover, Days of Unleavened Bread, so it's all right for us to repeat some of this. I wanted to start off by going to First uh, Corinthians in chapter five and verse eight. And uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, For this reason, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. With the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, you know, I've already started kind of eye eyeing things in my cabinet that I'm going to be getting rid of for unleavened bread. And there's a lot of different words you look for, you know, leavening is one of them. Uh, baking soda is one of them, right? But when we're keeping unleavened bread, you've never looked on a box of something that's unleavened and said, oh, one of the ingredients of this particular unleavened bread is sincerity and truth. You know, that's not an ingredient that is put on a label. But yet here in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, we're told to keep this feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, another verse I wanted to turn to over in uh, the Old Testament, let's go over to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 51. And this uh, particular chapter is a wonderful chapter for you and I to read in our own time, you know, really any time of the year, but especially when you're when you're beginning to go through the process of examining yourself. And in Psalms chapter 51, and we're not going to read the whole chapter. I'm just going to read a few of the verses, but I wanted to begin in verse 1. Psalms chapter 1, 51. It says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight that you might be justified when you speak and be in the right when you judge. And that's what Neil was just talking about. You know, um, uh, Today, we have good judges and bad judges, right? And even the judges that we might refer to are good judges are still not perfect judges, right? But God judges righteously and perfect. He knows all. In verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. Did my mother conceive me? And behold, now listen to this, and remember 1 Corinthians 5, 8. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you shall make me to know wisdom. God desires truth within you and me, within our inward parts. Within our inward parts. Now let's go to a verse that I looked up and Neil had this, and I was like, uh-oh. Uh, this was one of the last ones he read. It's Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having confidence to enter into the true holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach God with a true heart. With a true heart. With full conviction of faith, our hearts having been purified from the wicked conscience and our bodies having been washed with pure water. In just a few weeks, we're going to begin our journey. Neil even gave the countdown. Uh, through the holy days of God once again. And we're going to begin it with, you know, Passover and the days of unleavened bread. 
uh, we'll renew our commitment to Christ that we made at baptism. For some of us, that might not have been that long ago. For others of us, it might have been a long time ago. But we're going to renew that commitment. And we're going to follow it up by removing sin from our lives for the next seven days. Did you notice what I just said there? We're not going to do it by removing unleavened bread from our lives. We're going to do it by removing sin from our lives for the next seven days. Now, some sins are easily seen by you and others. But let's be honest for a moment. Many of the sins that we have aren't visible to others. In fact, some of our own sins might not even be visible to ourselves. There are some sins that you know that no one else knows. But then there's even some sins that you and I are guilty of that we don't even know we're guilty of. And some places, in, uh, some people refer to those as sins of ignorance. But irregardless, it's still sin. So God in his wisdom decided to instruct us to use unleavened bread, right, as a tool, as a physical tool to teach us what? That sin is everywhere. It's everywhere. And you know, um, now is the time for us all to, to make a commitment and to begin preparing. We don't want the days of unleavened bread or Passover or the Lord's Supper. We don't want those things to sneak up on us because then we're not doing our due diligence to prepare for it. And to do some meditation, to do some prayer, to do some reflecting of what these days represent. You know, the upcoming days of unleavened bread, for some, and maybe even for us from time to time, was only a physical journey. You know, the removing of unleavened bread, that's pretty physical. You think about it, you know, get the bread out of the house. Go vacuum the car. But we got to dig deeper. Because God doesn't desire your house to just be unleavened. He desires for us to be unleavened without sin. He desires for us to clean our temples, to dig deeper, to keep the unleavened bread, the days of unleavened bread, with what? Sincerity, right? Now, That's why we're told to keep it with truth and sincerity. And, I, you know, this hit my mind right before I walked up, and I wanted to bring this up, kind of a little side note. I think we would all be in agreement here. What was the, out of every sacrifice that has been done on the face of this earth since the beginning of time, what was the most important sacrifice that's ever taken place? This is easy. Right? It's a sacrifice of Christ. It's a sacrifice of Christ. Now, that's not the only sacrifice that's ever taken place, but it is the most important. Right? And all the other sacrifices that took place before the sacrifice of Christ, and even some took place after, because the Jewish people continued doing sacrifices, right? Those sacrifices do not even come close to the sacrifice of Christ. Neil popped a picture up, and you've probably seen over the years your own, you know, television or videos or whatever, depicting over the years, the Jewish people, the Israelites, when they would sacrifice an animal, it was done very humanely. They bring a lamb or whatever the particular animal is they're sacrificing, and as Neil showed, they're laying it on the ground. They're making eye contact. They take that knife. They slit the uh, throat. The, the animal just ceases to exist. Right? There's nowhere in the scripture that I'm aware of where it, it, it would tell them to, to beat those animals violent, violently before they sacrificed them. Is that anywhere in the Bible? No, it's not. It's nowhere in the Bible where they were to to stone those animals before they killed them or to beat them or to mock them or to spit on them or slap on them. No, they didn't do that, did they? They took those animals 
and it was a very high event because what was it representing? Sins being forgiven and various things like that. And they put them on the altar. And only certain people could do this, the priest. And and they, they had the fire, right? Now, taking that information and knowing that none of those sacrifices that where those animals were treated humanely, respectfully, this is a serious thing, and yet you have the sacrifice that meant the most, really the only one that matters, right? And how was Christ, our sacrifice, treated before he was sacrificed? It wasn't humanely. He was spit on. He was beat. There was no, you know, when he took his last breath, there was, other than a few of his disciples and his mother, there was no one there that was looking at his eyes and, and, and crying because this wonderful sacrifice had just taken place to save the world. Think about that for a moment. Just a little side note, right? That the most important sacrifice that's ever taken place was done completely different from all the others. The other ones were treated much more respectfully, right? And so I, I, that just popped in my mind right before I came up. I thought I would throw that out there. Maybe you've already heard or have heard that or thought about that before, but it just hit me. Now, we know that there are those today that simply don't keep the days of unleavened bread, these, these days that, that we're about to, to begin to keep. And there are some that believe you shouldn't keep them at all. You know, uh, of course we do. But we need to make sure um, that we're hearing this, uh, the warning, that there, that there are those that keep this day, okay? There are some that keep the days of unleavened bread, but they're not doing it sincerely. And they're not doing it truthfully. Are we going to God in prayer and asking him to help us to keep these days with truth and sincerity? Now, I bring that up that there are those that are not keeping these days in truth and sincerity, not to sanction any of us to go out and try to identify who those people are. That's between them and God. But for us to look at ourselves, are we going to God in prayer and asking him to help us make the most of Passover and the days of unleavened bread? Because if we aren't careful we can turn the days of unleavened bread into what? Just a physical journey. Just a nice meal that we all have together. We get together once a year. We wash each other's feet. You know, we, we, we take the bread, we take the wine, then we have a nice meal for the night to be much remembered. It's so much more than that. Those are the physical things. And some of those physical things, they're nice. They are nice. And they have a lot of meaning in them. But it's so much more than that. Just like many of the Israelites, when they left Egypt, some of them, it was just a physical thing. Let's go to Hebrews uh, chapter 3, just a few pages over. Hebrews chapter 3, and uh, begin in verse 7. It says, For this reason, even as the Holy Spirit today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in rebellion, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. The day of temptation in the wilderness, right? where your fathers tempted me and tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Because of this, I was with that generation and said, they are always going astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath that they shall uh, enter into my rest. Beware, brethren, lest perhaps there be in, in any of you an evil heart of unbelief from the living God. Rather, be encouraging one another each day while it is called today so that none of you become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And in verse 14, for we are companions of Christ if we truly hold the confidence that we had at the beginning, steadfast until the end. Remember what I said. It's a time that we make a you know recommitment to the commitment that we made at baptism. You and I have an advantage of seeing these past scriptures, of knowing so much more of what's taken place than those that went before it. But it's not an advantage if we don't take advantage of it, right? 
it, it does us no good if we don't learn from it. It's hard for us to believe that even after a group of people saw countless miracles that God performed for Israel, that there was still unbelief. All the miracles they saw in the process of them being released from Egypt, and then the miracles that they saw after they left, but yet what? They still had unbelief. And it makes you wonder, you know, when, when Christ said, it is an evil generation that seeks after a sign. We need to make sure that we're not those that, that you know, just seek after a sign, right? We need to be seeking more. And in verse 16, uh, for some after hearing did rebel, but not all who came out of Egypt by Moses. We know that God led Israel through Moses out of Egypt. But verse 16 lets us know that there were some that left Egypt physically. But they weren't really following God or even Moses. They were just walking with the group. Right? And, you know, there's really not a way um, for us to, to, to know who those people are. And, and we have the parable of the, the tares and the wheat, right? So we'll pull those tares out. No, you can't do that. Why? Because it will, it will disturb the wheat. And so God allows for some times, and he did here when they were leaving Egypt, for there to be tares among us, among us, right? And you don't get caught up in, in oh, he's a tear, she's a tear. You know, that's, 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 that's very dangerous, very dangerous. Uh, but it is something that we need to be aware of. It is something we need to be aware of. We have to make sure that we aren't just walking the familiar steps. You know, oh, yeah, it's just, it's unleavened bread. It's just that time to throw those, you got to get rid of those cookies. You know, it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more than that. We have to make sure that this journey isn't just physical, but it's physical, yes, and spiritual. If we put more emphasis on the physical cleaning of our homes and cars than our spiritual temple, then we can be guilty of not keeping the days of unleavened bread and sincerity and truth, right? What good is it if your house has no cookies in it and your car has no breadcrumbs in it, but you or me are filthy, right? Then we're doing, and I'm using a lot of, uh, not pulling out the verses, but what did Christ, he referred to the tombstones, white sepulchers full of dead man's bones. We don't want to fall in that category. Let's go to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. You know, uh, I know Lonnie, Lonnie Grigsby uh, has been a friend of our families for a long time. And, and so long that there's a lot of things I don't even know because I was a young child when, when Lonnie first started coming around. My sister and older brother have more memories with him than I do. But uh, he, uh, my parents thought the world of him. And he also had a very high regard for my parents. And uh, I know him and Cindy had just, you know, occasionally would come to services due to distance and they were on the road a lot. But uh, uh, Lonnie was, a, was just a one of a kind person. And, uh, you know, really uh, I saw that everybody was signing the card and everything and just uh, can't imagine what uh, Cindy's going through. But uh, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 20, uh, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 10. I'm reading a few verses here. And after calling the multitude to him, uh, he said to them, Hear and understand. That which goes into the mouth does not defile a man, that that which comes out of the mouth, this defiles the man. Then his disciples came to him and said, Do you realize that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Okay. But he answered and said, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Leave them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. What's he telling them? He was telling them that they're tares. Leave them alone. You know, he didn't say, let's go kill them. Right? Let's go eradicate them. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the pit. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. But Jesus said to him, are you also still without understanding? You know, 
And we can sit here and make fun of Peter and say, man, he didn't understand that. There's a lot of things that one day when this book is continued, we better hope that stories of us aren't put in there. Because there would be things we would just be like this and Peter would be saying, oh, you thought my thing was bad. Look what you did, Richard Bogan, you know, or Ben Franklin or whatever. So keep in mind, these men were very intelligent. Okay. Um, and Christ was, uh, you know, d answering to him, are you also still without understanding? And in verse 17, do you not perceive that everything that enters the mouth goes into the belly and is expelled into the sewer, but the things that go forth from the mouth come out of the heart and these defile the man for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnessing and blasphemy. And in verse 20, these are the things that defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. We need to remember that. This isn't me saying, oh, it doesn't matter if you eat bread with leavening in it. No, missing the point. We're still to observe the days of unleavened bread. But the point is, you know, and this has happened several times I know in my home. It might be weeks after unleavened bread. And I pick up a backpack and there's an oatmeal cream pie in it. And that oatmeal cream pie was in the house during the days of unleavened bread. Did that defile the whole process of me keeping the days of unleavened bread? Was my intent just in vain? No. Right? And although the bread that might have been in my home is is the is the 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 shadow is the school teacher for us in this situation it's not the whole point the whole point is putting the sin out of our lives doing some internal right examining and 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 i believe that's that's the point in verse 11 that which goes into the mouth that does not defile the man but that which comes out of the mouth that defiles the man it's the same thing. I know my kids, when you know, when you when you first start teaching your teaching your kids, you don't eat pork, you don't eat this. And they come home that day and they say, I accidentally, you know, uh, I was eating something and uh I, it had pork in it. And uh, you know, you don't look at the kids and say, Well, that's it, man. It's not snowing you. You're going to hell. No, that's 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 not right. I know uh, um, some of the questions that I've gotten from people over the years was was one. Uh, I had, we had some friends at one time, and they didn't know if my kids could eat the animal crackers that were pigs. And I said, yes, the the pig animal crackers are fine. At first, I didn't understand what they were asking. I thought that they were asking me if, you know, some stuff has lard in it. And I was like, no, I don't think the animal crackers have got lard in them. She goes, no, the, the pig crackers. And I was like, yeah, they can eat that all they want. And if they want, they put barbecue sauce on it. But but that's, you know, I know, uh, and, and I know I'm getting off on tangents here, but man, when Benjamin was very young, he was in daycare. And we we put him in daycare. And it had food allergies. Well, instead of going through the whole spiel, I put down there, he had an allergy to pork. That way they went feeding pork. You know, I put shellfish, you know. One day I get a phone call, Mr. Franklin. And I was like, yeah. And they said, we've, we've got a problem. Uh, okay, what is it? Well, we were having green eggs and ham to, for breakfast today. And, and, and Benjamin, he took a bite of the, the ham and I grabbed him and pulled it out of his mouth. And we've got him in the cafeteria. We're watching him. The nurse is watching him. And I was like, oh, I said, okay, no big deal. And uh, she goes, well, uh, do you need to come up here? Does he need to go to the doctor? And I was like, no, no, he's fine. Let him go back to class. And they were like, well, did you not just hear what I said? And I, I was like, uh, <laughs> and they said about the food allergy. And so then I started learning, well, I guess technically I shouldn't put down a food allergy. Because then, you know, I said, no, no, it's a religious reason. Huh? It's like it's a religious reason he can't eat, eat can't eat ham. So I think it traumatized him. He was sitting there the whole time. He didn't know what was going on. But you know, 
but what what we put in our mouth is is not really the game okay that's not the big rock now it is a big part of the days of unleavened bread and we need to abide by by what's been asked for us to do but that is a small piece of what is trying to be taught to us the big picture is putting sin out of our life and what does unleavened bread represent you know christ isn't specifically speaking here about the days of unleavened bread but the spirit of what he's saying applies okay or at least i believe it does it applies um it's not the crumb of bread that you missed under the couch or the cookie you missed in the pantry that defiles you it's the crumb of sin that you continue to allow to be in your temple that defiles you that's the crumb you got to worry about that's the piece of bread you got to worry about it's the sin that remains because you haven't asked god to help you purge it out and remember those sins of ignorance if you don't know you're sinning you can't really ask god hey remove this you don't even know you're doing that so you need to make sure in your prayers and your meditation that you're asking god to open your eyes to things that you might be doing or not doing or undoing that you shouldn't be sins of ignorance as some refer to it so that god can show those things to you but you also I, I was always told always ask god to show you in meekness and kindness too because you you don't want him to say okay you want to know what all you're doing wrong here you go no you know i mean you 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 want uh mercy and as we know god is a merciful god it's not the unleavened bread that you physically put in your mouth that makes you clean right it's the process of putting leaven or sin out of your temple and replacing it with what? Christ. Christ is the unleavened bread. He is the bread from heaven. He is the manna, right? He is the true and sincere bread that we eat during the days of unleavened bread, you know. And so it's also important to eat that bread every day. And, and, and not to just be eating it as you're walking around. But every day, if not multiple times a day, take a little time and think about that bread you're eating and what it represents. And, and be thankful for that sacrifice that he made for you and I that went un, un, unattended, like all the other sacrifices before it. You know, with no humanity whatsoever. Let's go to Luke, uh, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. So, I mean, let's see. Hopefully, this is some value uh, to you today. And if, and if you didn't learn anything today, you learned that Satan has a sister. You know. But in Luke chapter 22 and verse 7, it says, Then came the day of unleavened, in which it was obligatory to kill the Passover lambs. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare Passover for us that we may eat. But then he said to him, where do you desire that we prepare it? And which is, is something that, you know, he had sent them to prepare. It. And he said to them, watch, and when you come into the city, you will meet a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters. And you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest chamber where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And uh, verse 12, and he shall show you a large upper room furnished there, prepare and he went and found everything exactly as he said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Now when the hour had come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, with earnest desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I will not eat of it again until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, we've read this verse many times. We read it, obviously, around the season. But let this sink in. Christ desired to eat this Passover with the apostles. Do you think he desires to eat it with you and I? Think of all the Passovers that Christ had seen. He had seen every one of them, right? From a different vantage point, being in the Spirit. And yet this was the one and the only one that we know that he says, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 
He knew completely what was about to take place. And he just still was so happy that he was about to do the thing that he was about to do for all of us. Christ desired to eat this Passover with apostles. And like I said, does he desire to eat it with us? That's a hard question for us to ask ourselves. You know, in this scripture, he also says he will not eat again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Is it possible that one day in the future, when we eat this meal in the kingdom of God, that Christ is going to say the same thing to everyone that's there? I have desired to eat this with all of you. How many will be there? Right? And that's speculation, but it seems to, to make sense, you know. But we know it's going to be eaten again. Christ was looking forward to this celebration. Do you think he's looking forward to the next one? If you knew Christ would be joining us for Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread this year, what would you be doing different? How much more emphasis or time would you put on the examining yourself if you knew that in a few weeks from now, when we come to this very room, if Christ was going to be here? We should put that type of emphasis on it every year because he is here with us. He is here with us when we're doing it. And if we understand correctly, he's here with us today. All right? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. In uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1. We'll read a few uh, verses here. Okay, that threw me off there for a minute. This clock hadn't been changed. I looked up and I went, man, uh, we're about to get out early. Uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 4 and verse 1, it says, Therefore we should fear, lest perhaps a promise being open to enter into his rest any of you might see to come short. For truly, we have the gospel preached to us even as they also did. But the preaching of the word did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard. For we have believed, we ourselves are entering to the rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. And we know here this word rest is referring to the Sabbath right? Or we should know that. You, you look that up. But uh, for he spoke in a certain place about the seventh day in this manner. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Isn't it a blessing to be able to rest today? It really is. And even for those of us that are retired, you know, you still got various things you do during the week. Yeah, you might not get up and go to work every day, but you still got various things you do during the week. But on the Sabbath, you're able to shut everything down and kick back and relax, right? And uh, that's a blessing. And again, concerning this, if they shall enter into my rest, there are those that have an attitude that they will not enter into this rest. And you and I should pray for those individuals because one day in the future, they're going to be, you know, given the facts, the truths, and they're going to have to make a decision at some point. And we should pray that they choose God's way. We should pray that everyone chooses God's way. And even with the things that you and I one day may be encountered with, things that we need to change in our lives, we should all pray for ourselves whenever that comes, that we make the right decisions. Uh, consequently, since it remains for some to enter into it, and those who had previously heard the gospel did not enter into it because of disobedience. Right? And we think about Israel when they left Egypt. You know, disobedience. It's a common thread throughout the Bible that man does not want to do what God says. 
Again, he marks out a certain day. Today, saying, David, after so long a time, exactly as it has been quoted above, today, if you will hear his voice, harden your hearts. Harden not your hearts, excuse me. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken long afterwards of another day. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath keeping for the people of God. For the one who has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his works, just as God did from his own works. You know, God God put his tools down on this day. We should too. We should be diligent, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, even dividing asunder, soul and spirit, and both the joints and the marrow, and is able to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And this is what Neil was talking about as well. God can judge you and I completely. And we are very thankful that his son gave his life for us. Because if we are judged and there is no sacrifice, then we are doomed. Even the best one of us. Right? Even the best one of us. We could say Lonnie Grigsby. As far as I know, he was a wonderful man. But even Lonnie is doomed without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And there is not a created thing that is not manifested in his sight, but all things are naked and laid before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Think about that. And this is why it is very important, I should have put this verse in here, that if we judge ourselves, right, things are a lot easier. And so we need to make sure we're doing this. Having therefore a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, we should hold fast the confession of our faith. For we do not have a high priest who cannot empathize um, with our weaknesses, but one who was tempted in all things according to the likeness of our own temptations, yet without sin. You know, Christ, God in the flesh, but he was tempted. He was tempted. And if he was tempted, you know what that means? He could have sinned. He could have sinned. And we better be thankful that he did. Because by him being without sin, he became that ultimate sacrifice. Therefore, we should come with boldness to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. The ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ, made possible by the death of Jesus Christ, but it was made possible because when he was on this earth and tempted by Satan in every possible fashion, he overcame it. He overcame it. Every temptation. And we have some of those that are documented in the scripture for us to read. But there are, I'm sure, many more that are not documented. And maybe we will find out about those one day in the future. But he was tempted. You know, think about these things as you're preparing for Passover in the Days of Unleavened Bread. Think about these things as you're preparing for life every day, right? The temptations that you're, you're hit with, the, the, the various things that happen, right? Being very... Uh, careful not to become a judgmental person. It's very easy to look at others, right? And to judge them, right? Very hard, you know, not to be a person that that is, a, you know, pra practicing forgiveness is something that we should becoming, be, be becoming better at, right? It, it's something that we should be growing in. Because when we learn to forgive others, for a brief moment, in that moment that we're doing that, we, we're taking on just a, I don't, I don't want to overspeak, but we're taking on a little bit of 
uh, characteristic of God. Right? And, and we need to be aware of that. For 40 years, God allowed Israel to wander in the wilderness because of their unbelief. And He will let you wander in unbelief your entire life too. You think about that. He will show you the things that He wants to show you or He will not show you anything. Be thankful for the things He's shown you, for the times your eyes have been open. And, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that when He shows us things, He watches to see how we react to them. And I believe that when you react in a positive way, not immediately in most cases, but in due time, He opens your eyes to more understanding. Right? And and uh, sometimes that next piece of understanding he opens to us, guess what? We don't make the right decision on it, maybe. Maybe we go down the wrong road for a little while, but then we get back on the right road, you know? So it's a constant trial and tribulation for you and I. With Christ help, we can do all things, right? That's what the scripture tells us. Well, let's make sure that we aren't keeping the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread that are about to come up just physically, that we're keeping them with truth and sincerity and that we're doing this in every aspect of our life. And hopefully these next holy days that are coming up will be the best ones you've ever had, you know. And until, you know, the next go around, you know, then that year will be the better one, right? But ask yourself that question. If you knew Christ was going to be keeping the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread with you this year, you know, we got up here, you know, just like Mr. Haber sometimes comes in town and speaks. If Neil said, if you look on your calendar, this year for Passover, Christ will be here. Right? Oh, I mean, I, I can imagine, I bet everybody would probably, <laughs> you, you can't imagine what would happen, right? Kaki would go berserk. Right? She She would be not just locking the front door. She'd, she'd have security guards out there, right? So, I mean, just think about that in, 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 in all actuality. And whatever that thinking process is, that's what we should be doing. That's what we should be doing. And I hope that uh, we all have a, a, a good process of examining ourselves. And I know that in the next few weeks or what have you, we'll start kind of doing some physical cleaning. Don't forget the spiritual cleaning.